So before the talk, I request our uh, in faculty professor Ranjan Borman to kindly introduce the speaker. Yeah, good afternoon and welcome again to the Boost Colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Professor Martina Schellemann with us. He is a Swiss physicist and currently a professor at the University of Kaiserslautern in Germany. His research program is devoted to the investigation of ultrafast phenomena in solids, thin films, and nanoparticles. This includes the combination of short pulse laser system with surface science technology in order to develop novel methods for measuring ultrafast relaxation processes in real time with high temporal and spatial resolution. Professor Aschelimann uh, received his PhD from ETH Zurich in 1989, and then he did a postdoctoral work in NIST and University of Rochester in USA from 1989 to 93. And then he came back to ETH Zurich once more for five years. And then he was appointed as a professor in the University of Essen in Germany in 1998. And in 2000, he moved to the University of Kaiserslautern, Germany as a professor. He is an elected council member of the German Physical Society at various times, and he has various other accolades. He is an advisory board member of Stanford Linear Accelerator Pulse and chair of priority program of ultrafast nano optics 
of DFG and Chair for Condensed Matter Section of DFG from 2015 to 18. And uh, he was also the you know, director of the Nanostructuring Center of the University of Kaiserslautern and being head of the central research facility called Laboratory for Advanced Spin Engineering or LASC. He's an editorial board member of New Journal of Physics, and he has published more than 200 very high impact papers. And uh, today we are going to talk, uh, listen to some of his uh, interesting works. <coughs> so over to you, Professor. Uh, I should put that. Okay. Uh, okay. Any questions or problems to let the end of our discussion about this issue? Thanks very much. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It's for me for the first time, and I really enjoy it to be here. Of course, it was a shock a little bit from the winter snowing directly to the hot weather here on this center, but uh, of course, I will survive. So, as you have heard, I will talk about attraction, the semantism fraction of my group, and I will talk about the new effects of these ultra-fast lazy to spin dynamics in alloys and multi-layer structure, which can happen to an electron charge transfer one system to the other. <laughs> But first, I will give a short introduction into the field of photosynthesis change of magnetization. I know most of you do time is off focus, so it will be boring the first 10 minutes. But for all the rest, not everybody every day uses a laser. I would like to introduce it a little bit, as well as the XUV mode technique. Then I will talk a little bit the microscopic origin of the magnetization processes. And well, finally, the most important one is the Oyster model, which was developed, let's say, four years ago. Okay, it's a lot of cooperation. Of the, I remember of my group who works in this field in the last five years, together with Matthias, Stefan Matthias, he was a co worker of mine, he's now a professor in Göttingen. Most of the sample comes from Augsburg, from the group of Alp, Manfred Albrecht. And the system team okay set up that was developed with the Boulder group from Chile, her name was Captain. And we have a lot of collaboration with the edition, which is very important in our field. Okay, what is the driving force of magnetism? Since I'm in the graduate school, it's all the time to works. It should be faster, but it should be smaller now over the last 30, 35 years. And here I think we reach the bottom. The nanoparticles are now so small that they are not stable anymore in, at room temperature. And you can see that quite easily. That was very important for my whole research life. But every time I bought a computer, it was already old fashioned because the next generation was better, higher storage density and so on. That has leveled off, let's say, so about 2015. Um, the reason that's what I have shown before the, we cannot 
come to smaller domains, not small. We cannot use smaller nanoparticles. We can improve a little bit, but not a much. But where we really can improve is in the time scale. We are still working in the nanosecond, picosecond time scale on devices, but magnetism is much faster. That will be the topic of my talk today. And for me, it's even more important, not just for the device, just to understand. It's a simple question. How fast can we switch a magnet? That was my question during my master thesis. And I still don't know it. That's the fun out of it. So I'm not just interested how fast we can manipulate spin. I would like to understand what are the physical processes behind it, and what is the real limitation, how I can influence the spin direction of a of an atom or a molecule or even of a whole uh, magnetic domain. The time scale, we can go a little bit with the energy. It's time energy relation. We know magnetic anisotropy or 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 3 electron volt. That's some picosecond nanoscale. That's what we typically have the precession. Spin orbit energy, we are already, let's say, in the higher femtosecond time scale. With exchange, we are really about 13, 15 femtoseconds. So, when we will go really understand how fast we can do it, the only possibility to study that is with lasers. Maybe one simple, you have an ultra-short laser pulse, femtoseconds to the even at a second, you disturb the system, but you watch what happens. For example, you apply a beam in the opposite direction, you hit with a focused laser beam, and you create a magnetic train. As it was used in magnet optic recording, what was it, 20, 25 years ago, which was the major mass storage device around 2000. On one way, we just switch and we just shoot once and we check if it has switched or not. And Bobman called it one of the typical boom experiment that you shoot with the laser pulse and you just check it did it or it cannot or it switched. But then uh, you see this fast, but how fast it really is, you cannot measure it on this time kit. You just can see if it's possible or not. When you would like to measure dynamics, you have to do it on a fan probe approach. So you have to disturb the system somehow with a laser pulse and suitable delay, you have to probe the state of the system if it has switched or not switched. But that means you need a reversible process. So switching is unfortunately not a reversible process. That means whenever you would study the dynamics of switching, you have every time to switch back to the neutral state without the magnetic domains and start again. And then you have to do that a million times and it's a time consuming experiment for a PSC suit. So 99% of all experiments in this field are done with the field parallel to the magnetization of the thin film. And we just measure the demagnetization and the recovery of the magnetization back to zero, which happens normally so in the <coughs> nanosecond, microsecond time scale, depending on the material, how fast they can bring the heat out of the pathways here. The dynamics, the microscopic processes are, for most cases, the same. It's not completely. All optical switching is something you cannot. This must be a different mechanism than just demagnetization. It will may depend a little bit. But for most of the processes, you can understand those about switching when you understand the magnetization process. What happens when you heat with a femtosecond laser pulse? Of course, the light is absorbed by creating hot electrons. That's simple. And then first, the heat is distributed among the electron itself. It depends on the material. It can be 100 femtosecond. It can be a few hundred femtosecond, depending on how many states you have around the Fermi energy. And then it can take up to a few picoseconds until the bottom system is in a thermal equilibrium with the hot electron system. And during this time scale, because the heat conductivity of the electronic system is much lower, 
then in the funnel system you can heat the electronic system to thousands, ten thousand degree, and then it goes down by heating up the lattice. That means in this time scale we have to determine on equilibrium. We have a hot electron gas, but still a cold uh, lattice. So that helps to check how far, uh, how now the whole system reacts when it's faster. The spin dynamic is faster than it. A picosecond, you know, it's just a hot electron system or can heat the system, but it takes a picosecond, you know, you have to first heat the phonon system and the phonon will then come to the magnon system. Well, during my PhD time, we had no femtosecond laser at, available at that time. And with a picosecond laser, I me measured the reaction of the spin system and it took 100 plus 580 picoseconds. That looks ugly, but at that time he had one hertz. Just think about to make an experiment today with a terrible picosecond system with one hertz. It's still correct. It's now in gadolinium. We have the double exponential decay. The, the second decay is exactly this time scale. So the value is not wrong, but it's not the whole story. Because four years later, I think that's well known, Borefer and Vigo used the femtosecond titanium sapphire amplifier to measure the gain in nickel. But he found that this a ferromagnet can react faster than in the picosecond to an external disturbance as you were femtosecond laser found. Which of course then shows it's not this way. You have not to heat the phonon system. The hot electron system can do the job because we have a strong thermal non equilibrium that can be even faster because you can heat up the electronic system to 10,000 degrees, what will not be possible with a picosecond laser system. But to all during my PhD time, we learned it's not the energy transfer either from the hot electrons, from the thermalized electron system, or from the lattice, which is the limiting factor. The limiting factor is the angular momentum. Whenever you change magnetism, you have to transfer angular momentum somewhere to another system. And due to the einstein de Haas effect, that is when you have a magnetic system, you change the magnetization, it starts to rotate. The einstein de Haas effect shows that finally the angular momentum has to be transferred to the lattice. That can be directly uh, from the spin system to the phonon system, due to maybe macron phonon coupling or so on, or you uh, transfer first time momentum to the orbital system and then a rather fast to phonon system. And we still believe, that I'm still be sure that's the limiting factor for any dynamics in the spin system. Okay, now how can you do such measurements? Just roughly because that's done here in many, many labs as I have seen it today. We also use the time resolved mode experiment where we heat with a femtosecond laser pulse and then we probe with a second suitable delayed laser pulse. We do it opposite to here. Here you pump with blue and probe with red. We do it vice versa, we pump with red or Probe is blue. The reason we use different colors is the same as here. You would like to avoid coherent effect. You would like to avoid pure optical effect, but you can get rid when you do not reach the system with the first laser pulse and you probe with the same energy transfer or electronic excitation channel as you have to pump. Here you see typical time result measurements, the whole hysteresis. You see the height of the hysteresis changes as the net magnetization of the system will be measured. And then it relaxes in a picosecond time scale back to equilibrium so that we can really use this as a reversible process here. Well, what we do, we just plot the height of the hysteresis. That means in the normal case, we did not take the whole hysteresis, we just take a measurement here, put the measurement here, or plot the differences. That has the advantage that optical care effect, effect, which also can influence the measurement, can be avoided because they are independent of the magnetization. 
And when it subtracts the value from here to here, you get rid of most, not all, but most of the optical artifacts which may influence your measurements. And you see here the plot that's just uh, the decay of the magnetization and the recovery again as a function of the Pembroke delay. And we are mainly interested in the really the first picosecond. And on the later came to our lab, I never thought about this ringing, what happens thereafter, or the precession or region two or region three. We are just interested how fast you can quench and how strong you can quench the magnetization. So that's just the first decay. But when you read the literature, for example, for nickel, you get value between 40 femtosecond and 240 femtosecond. The beginning, the theoreticians were very angry about us. We should decide if it's now one or the other. And then we are able to show that it depends on many parameters. For example, on the quenching, when you quench just little, you see then the demagnetization time is under 20 seconds. When you quench stronger, we have seen that in the talks this morning, you get the same results here. It increases up to 160 femtoseconds. And when you heat the whole system over the degree temperature, it can become as fast as 40 femtoseconds. So the measurements were correct, even when they are done in different labs. It was just done by different quenching. There are other artifacts which I will now discuss the following my talk. In the beginning, it was discussed with the three temperature model that comes from uh, St. Petersburg. Even it was written the first time of Porter Fair and Pigot, but we already know in our lab in the 1980s that very phenomenological, you can describe it as a temperature of the electron gas, the temperature of the column system, and temperature of the spin system. On the energy transfer is just given by the temperature, linearly by the temperature difference between these different uh, paths. And here, of course, there's excitation to the laser pulse, which just reacts with the electronic system. Later, we, together with the Kopman group, we Increase that a little bit with the Elliot Jaffet theory. Elliot Jaffet say that again we have to transfer regular momentum to the lattice. But the possibility is when the electrons scatter with a phonon, they can flip the spin and transfer the regular momentum to the lattice. That would be a way that's called Elliot Jaffet was first discussed or developed for gallium arsenide as for a optical pumping of gallium arsenide, or, but Kopman has a job that can also be used for paramagnets. Well, that's uh, this additional term well, in microscope so that we climb up the ladder of one old. Most important here is the spin and flip probability. How often an electron has to scatter on a phonon until it flips the spin? That can be quite different for different materials. It is, in most cases, rather low. But as you have up to 10, up to 100 times scatter, scattering process until you can click the spin. Then it was further developed in the group of purple rate failed, which always not the difference between the temperature of the electron system and the phonon system or the spin system. It's the chemical potential mu. Who is the driving force, the difference of this is, of course, who is different for majority and minority electrons that increased and a little bit the uh, uh, number of equations. For certain systems, it's better to use this new model. Sometimes it's better to use our M3DM model. Okay. Now, another effect. We have seen when we deposit the exactly same quality of a nickel film is the same thickness on a gold film that the decay is much faster than the decay when we deposit on magnesium oxide. You see it's a different of two. And it was then Patiato open here in uh, the addition in Uppsala who have shown that that's a transport effect. That means we excite a lot of 
of the electrons. And when the majority of the electrons runs out from the nick of paramagnetic system into a, into a conductive material like coal, that also reduces the magnetization of the nickel film. Or the, as you have seen, it's much, much faster than the demagnet local demagnetization due to, let's say, the or the upward effect. There's a factor of two. So transport can be in certain systems even faster than local spin flip processes in a paramagnetic film. <laughs> so the next question. We know, let's say locally, that these electrons scatter with the, with the phonon and flip their spin and transfer the momentum to the lattice. The question is a little bit, is it dominated by the hot electrons? or already by thermalized electron gas. When it would be optically here, and everything would happen also transport ballistically, then you still would be able to say, okay, there can be a coherent effect that you can use that to do probe experiments and so on. When it first has to thermalize, needs a thermalized electron gas, then it's clear it's a secondary process and the coherence is completely gone. That can be tested when you use different wavelengths of lasers. For example, this is the density of states of the <clears throat> majority electrons, blue, the red minority electrons. So that's our calculation, the FD calculation done in the Schneider group because it's often when you take different wavelengths of lasers here, 0 0.7 electron volt, the infrared laser. You excite mainly minority electrons, excited minority electrons. When you use 2.5 electron volt, it's mainly majority electrons what you uh, excite. So when the optically excited electrons will do the job, then you should see a difference if you use an infrared laser or you use a blue laser to excite the whole system. Because in one way you excite majority electrons here, and in the other laser you excite minority electrons. But we were sure that we should see a difference in the decay of the magnetization depending on the wavelengths. And we have been very astonished when we have seen that the decay just depends on the amount of energy you put in. That means we just have to compare with the same quenching that we have deposited the same amount of energy in the system, but the decay was completely exactly absolutely the same, independent if you have now a photon energy of 0 0.7 electron volt or 2.5 or something between. Again, very astonishing. We have to accept it. That really means it looks like that the whole system has to be first thermalized until it really starts to heat up the spin system that takes too long. Because the lifetime, of course, of hot electron is very short. For transition metal, it's sometimes less than a femtosecond. So they can scatter very fast with each other and thermalizes before then the transfer of environment to the lattice happens. Okay, next question we try to solve is. We investigated nickel. We have the feeling, so more or less, we do understand what happens. Iron, they behave different. But what happens when you have an alloy or multi layer structure, very thin layers? Now they are suddenly exchange coupled. And electrons from one can flip the spin with the other one without transferring element to any other degree of green. That can be very fast. But in order to do that, you need an element specific technique that, that for nickel iron, for example, that does not work using Moke in visible region, because you cannot say if the signal is not depends on the nickel or on the or the iron supply this. So you have to use M or L edge magnetic spectroscopy methods. Uh, I think L edge is well known, magnetic circular dichroism or linear dichroism. MH was at that time, just 10 years ago, undeveloped, 
for each and also from the theoretical point of view, but it should have worked the same way. Here you need photons, femtoseconds, photons below 100 femtoseconds. That's something you can create with high harmonics. Let me just explain how. Here you need a X ray laser, femtosecond X ray laser, that's three electron laser. Uh, that's not something you can build on your own at home, that you have to apply for green time, but that's not granted so often very near. So that's the reason we moved into the MH measurements using the idea of high harmonic, and not for us. It's now well known, Nobel Prize spent this year in physics with the three pioneers in this field. You can use that to create even at the second place of health or from analysis. You just focus a femtosecond amplifier because in a noble gas chat you create high harmonics with all numbers, and then you can select the ones you need for your experiment. We didn't use a noble gas chat. We worked together with the group of Murnay Captain in Boulder. And we have here a hollow fiber where we focus the laser light into. We use this device also for surface science studies. And the gas load of this side is, of course, much lower than when you have an open gas chat. If you have a huge chamber filled with gas, you tend to minus three millibars. So that's the setup. We have a pump house on the sample. And we have a probe pouch which goes through this hollow fiber. And then we just measure the signal on the CCD camera. We have here these high harmonics at the certain gas pressure. We can fit that with the gas pressure, with the gas we put in. If you see here is MH of iron, cobalt, platinum, nickel, manganese, rhodium, they are quite separated. We can measure on each of these lines simultaneously in parallel. That means when we have a compound, we can measure the signal for iron as well as nickel at the same time with the same laser pulse with the same compound. The technique is called uh, XUV T-MOKE. It's a T-MOKE transfer MOKE. We excite from the MH into close to the unoccupied states around the Fermi energy. On well, depending, it needs an in-plane magnetization, and depending of the magnetization direction, uh, the reflectivity not, it can change quite drastically. That is what called the asymmetry between when the magnetization is in one direction or in the other direction, the asymmetry can be as high as 90%. You need linear polarized light, but you need light in this XUV range, that means it is up to between 60 and 90 <coughs> electron volt. There are now measurements from iron nickel. You see here the image again from nickel. On here from uh, from here from nickel here from iron would you see the asymmetry it's quite clear it's a very nice strong signal at least when you compare to visible mokey but here you see now time result measurements how that decay as a function of time between purple probe and we can measure that simultaneously for the nickel as well as for the iron field when they are layered or even in a compound in the sublattis of both of them. Okay. Here you see now our first results we obtained. Okay, here now. We have strikes of nickel and iron, so it's the simultaneous parallel measurements. But you see they decay with the same intensity of the laser pulse different because our torture is different. Well, the magnetization of nickel is slower than the magnetization of iron. Now, when we have an alloy, let's have an alloy here, nickel 80, iron 20, you see they decay the same, but they have the same drenching. That's what we expected. They are out exchange coupled, and they will influence each other, so they have the same curing temperature, they have the same decay, time of the same drenching. That's what we saw at the beginning. And then we noticed that when you look exactly all the time, the blue is a little bit more to the right than to the left. Of course, nobody would ever believe that to us. We would never be able to publish. 
So, but we measure it all the time. That make us nervous and say, okay, how we can we increase that? We have to reduce the exchange energy between nickel and iron. That's well known. You put copper into the alloy. That weaken that weaken the Curie temperature on the exchange coupling becomes also weakened between them. And now, indeed, we have seen our clear delay between them. Again. Well, that was something we were able to accomplish at that time. And we explained it, in a, we did not understand why iron decays faster than nickel. But when that happens, whatever may be the reason, then exchange coupling will sit in. That means iron atom spin can scatter with a nickel spin, complete the on uh, electron to complete the spin with each other that does not change the net magnetization but it changed the magnetization of the iron network uh, sublattice and the nickel sublattice both on um, bricks both together and using this simple model equation we are able to treat our data quite well but again i will mention because i will come to that we did not understand why we have a delay here in nickel compared to iron. We noticed that later that when you change the alloy, the same happens also here, much stronger. It doesn't need this copper here. It seems to be depend critical on the band structure of the system. And we have seen that for alloys as well as multi-layer from the interface, you can have similar effect. <clears throat> so to summarize that part, we have uh, local spin trips, radio diopet scattering of the electrons or the phonon with the spin trip. We have transport, which can be faster. We have exchange, which even can be faster because we have not the transfer element to any other degree of freedom. But there must be something faster. Can we have a coherent? That's now oyster. Let me explain that. It was developed by Sangeeta Sharma with the time dependent DFT calculation. The basic idea what you see here. Let's say let's take your toy model and don't ask how you can do that experimentally. You have two manganese fields which are anti-parallel coupled to each other, one in this direction, the other one. That's the density of states, the occupied part, and that's the unoccupied part from the lower one. And that's from the upper one. Of course, it's the same, but just mirror. Now, when you optically excite, you have a problem here. You have a lot of occupied states here, but nearly no unoccupied state in this channel. But here you have nearly no uh, occupied states, but you have a lot of unoccupied states. But both channels are not strong because of the lack of density of states of one of the species. But at the interface, you can excite from this area in the huge unoccupied part from the other layer, or vice versa. That's what, after a lot of fighting, we call together inside spin transfer with this oyster effect. And then let's say this film is even thicker and stronger magnetized than this one. It's in the beginning anti ferromagnetic coupled, and then after a while, due to this exchange, inside spin excitation, you can even have a transient ferromagnetic field. That's what I showed you here. So it's a laser induced spin electricity charge transfer. It's on one way a pure optical effect. We do not change the net spin magnetization. We had this morning with one of the graduate students a discussion about that. Can you create a two, three field magnetization? <clears throat> I would say it's a great, it's a, I will show you in a minute. It can be just a sort of uh, oyster effect, but it's pure optical in nature. So that is the fastest way how you can influence pain directly. But again, it's not a change of the magnetization of the whole system, just to suit that word. But that it really can happen, here you say the calculation from Sankita with the real density of states, and you see the huge occupied part with the low unoccupied one, or vice versa on the other upper layer, and you nicely can excite electrons from here in the other layer. 
or it includes the magnetization of both layers. When we have seen that, we discussed that in Sagita, we, okay, we, we still have an old problem that's here. Why is iron faster than nickel? So we ask Sankita to also calculate to check the density of state here, and that was, is now really the case. Also here we have a noise there effect, we excite from the nickel, uh, minority electrons in the minority electrons of iron. They are ferromagnetic coupled. So that means we do not reduce in both system the magnetization. In nickel, we even increase it, the magnetization, because we reduce the number of minority electrons. And in iron, we increase the demagnetization because we increase here the number of minority electrons. The question is, is this something you, we can see really with our TMOC experimental that works when you see the real band structure that really happens? We have here this huge amount of occupied part in nickel and the unoccupied part in iron. It just depends if the MX magnetic spectroscopy really tests the spin polarization here around the Fermi energy. Again, there's not a lot of theory in this field. We had to look quite a lot of there are some publication which shows that the Earth field stern, you see it is 1975. Who has calculated MX spectroscopy and say that it's a direct uh, relation between the density of science around the F of the MX spectroscopy. So from this point, they are for it looks that is correct. And we can test that because in nickel we have areas which are influenced by oyster and some not. In nickel, only below the Fermi energy it's influenced because we shuffle electrons from here to the other side. Above, there is no effect from moisture, but vice versa in iron, that is just above the Fermi energy and below, they should not be affected. And when we check first here, which is not affected on, on the other side, we see we don't see any change between nickel and iron. When we look at the area where it's affected, it's a huge, we see this increase in nickel because we shuffle minority electrons to the other side. We see a fast increase in iron. So we can explain it. Now this difference between these two sublattices with this oyster effect. So he has done some PFD calculation. You see here the loss. If you see here the gain. And now they compared with our measurements, so you see the fit is quite well in the beginning. We have a deviation here, and that's clear, because thereafter we have the area of the effect, and that was not included, or the Sanghita cannot include that in her calculation. So that was not astonishing that we just had a fit in the first time, the 20 seconds thereafter, there are all constantly processes which are not included. So we for us, here is three step model. First, oyster, which is really very fast. The next change scattering, which equalizes nickel and iron. And that is the area of the offense scattering, which brings everything the normal demagnetization curve that we have seen it before. After nickel iron, there were other systems we had seen it together with Boulder, Göttingen, and uh, Uppsala. We Use the oyster material, this cobalt manganese germanium. This has different phases, a B2 and an A2, which has different density of states. And there you can nicely show that here we should have a strong oyster effect and here a weak. And also theoretically was a work done in in China. And that's the reason I showed because we had this discussion this morning with these two D systems where you have a transient magnetization, but I think it's also oyster effect that you shuffle electron from one layer in this compound in the other, because there's this, again a 2D system. Uh, and on this way on the interface, you also create a, not a net magnetization. Optically, you cannot make, uh, create a net magnetization, otherwise you would have to change like 
you know, the mind, the whole mind structure. And when you do not change the Christianity or the complete feeling, then it's possible only do an inside transfer that we have no net magnetization, but you have a spin transfer from one system to the other substance. In Moke, we mentioned we cannot see that. Which is definitely the case when you have pure system like iron, cobalt, nickel, and so on. Uh, iron, nickel would also not work because you have the independent transition in both systems. But for hoisters, you can sometimes just test one system. That's what we have shown again in a half hoister compared with a full hoister. I mean, not going into details, it just depends how many atoms you have. In a single crystal, and also theoretically, you can show in the half hours that you should have a strong effect, even with visible uh, okay experiment. And in a full hours, you should not see at all such an oyster effect. You see, that's a huge amount of omitters in this list, so the reason is quite clear. We have done these measurements nearly 15 years ago. We simply didn't understand it. We were, had no clue how we can create this care effect such a vampire. We tried many, many things, so more and more people, more and more samples came into, came into this game here until later, then with some Gita Sharma, we played our play now. Okay, you know. This is all the surface. Now we have two fast processes. We know transport is fast. Our oyster is, should be even faster. But which one would win when we have both together? So we check now nickel iron once on the isolating material and once on the wall to see when we have in addition transport. That's measurements we already have seen. Nickel iron on magnesium oxide. And we plotted the difference between iron and nickel here on this line, that's the green line. It's just the difference between this line and this line on each point and each time frame of the delay between the pump and the probe. Here on magnesium oxide, and when we have 10 nanometer gold, we already have a reduction, and with 100 nanometer gold, where you have a strong transport effect, oyster is gone. It's astonishing for us. We do not understand it, but we measured several times in different systems. But it looks like that transport out of the system destroys, let's say, this oyster effect is on the equilibrium between these two subnetworks. Again, that's very recent data. We do not understand it. We do some calculations with several addition. You see, I, I'm astonished because the oyster should be even faster than transport, but it shows it was the case. Because oyster will open a possibility, what Pico and Porter also wrote many years ago, that we can do coherent control experiment with magnetism. That must happen in the first femtosecond, or even in the attosecond time scale, because we know that an electron all bears the phases within a femtosecond. And then every information of the pump pulse is called as I already have shown. And this also may work that we excite directly the spin system with the laser or not with the secondary process through the optical excited electrons. And there was a measurement done, not in our group, but published three years ago for Martin Schulze and some co workers with uh, at the second. Three uh, experiment, and um, they use platinum nickel film or compared it with a pure nickel film. It's here is the half a second probe, here is the pump pulse, which is still a femtosecond second pulse, and they just probed in half a second steps. The reflectivity should, of course, should show a difference when on an half at a second excitation because that's a direct excitation of the electron ball gap. Uh, electron gas and you see that the red curve is the uh, I know the, the red curve is the transmission 
And that's the same for both fields. You see immediately decay in both cases, but the magnetization, you know, MCD measurement just changes when you have an interface and where you can have an oyster effect. Don't see anything in this time scale on uh, by a few nickel film. Later, you will see the normal demagnetization, but not within a few femtoseconds. They claim that that's a typical problem, that we have a coherent effect with the oyster effect with magnetism, which of course would open now a huge field of coherent control experiment. So to summarize my story through 35 years of femtosecond magnetism, you know we have local spin flips. There may be also electromagnetic scattering, there's still some, something which is debated if that happens or not happens. We have transport, which is even faster. We have exchange, which is again faster, because you can flip spin without transfer angulment to one other degree of freedom. And we have the oyster effect with directly this coherent effect, or goes directly to the spin system. With these words, I will close my talks. To summarize it is this picture here, which shows again the time scale of the different picture. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you for introducing to this anthropos processing magnetism. So maybe we take some questions. Yeah, please. Yes. Thank you for the very nice talk, sir. I have a few questions. Uh, okay. So first of all, uh, when you showed the direct and indirect processes influencing the demagnetization, uh, could you please show that? You used wavelength dependence of ultrafast demagnetization. Yes. And you uh, drew some conclusions on the apparent insensitivity of the demagnetization to the wavelength. Just a second, I tried to. As is yes. okay. So those maps are in the center. Is this here? Yeah. So uh, it wasn't, uh, I'm not able to understand from here, but uh, the current rotation itself is uh, known to have a complex dependence on the incident wavelength. So how is that intrinsic dependence eliminated when uh, comparing these phases? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, so the curl rotation yeah. uh, is has a complex dependence on the wavelength of the incident light. Okay, the probe was all the time the same. The probe was all the time the blue laser curls. That did not change. Okay. okay. But but for the pump laser, for the pump laser, we just check how much energy, how strong the quenching is. So we absorb the same amount of energy in the system when we quench 50% with each laser pulse. So we put the same amount of energy in the whole system. Of course, the absorption is frequency dependent, but then we had to just need more power. But it's somehow still something which I have a hard time to believe. When you create majority electrons, let's say you want to excite majority spin up electrons, or you excite with the just minority electrons, but you have the same demagnetization time. I still cannot believe it. For me, it's strange, but uh, I'm sure that uh, my graduate student has done this. He had to do this measurement many times until I believed it, I can tell you. But it's fun somehow, although you would not expect that. Sir, I have a related question. Sir, uh, if I believe those curves are showing the energy uh, uh, minority excitation and majority excitation. Yeah. The width would, I believe, correspond to the coherence times in a certain way. So why are the coherence times uh, longer for the minority carriers and shorter for majority carriers? Okay, minority now... Minority carriers are all wider. Uh, I'm not sure if you mean ballistic transport or you mean Coherence time. So ballistic, so for ballistic transport, you would assume that the electrons are all coherent due to the stress. And the coherence time would depend on the width of that uh, peak that you are showing. 
okay, the lifetime of electron is spin dependent because that is not the coherent side, but just the lifetime is spin dependent because a minority electron has more states it can decay into than a majority electron. Would I measure them? I think 30. Okay, yeah, yeah, on top. But it's not the coherence time. I would say the coherence time is the same, but the ballistic transport depends not only on the coherence time, it depends on the effective mass. On the theoretician explained it this way, that you have an S electron for the majority electron and a heavy D electron for the minority. If you really can believe that, I'm still a bit concerned, but that's how it comes. Yeah, I for me because I have to believe that. Yeah, uh, we have to believe it somehow, yeah. So I have uh, another question. So when the initial electron temperature rise occurs to uh, about 10 to the 4 Kelvin order, um, so does that influence uh, the properties of the system in an irreversible way in those types? No. No. As a, you have to, you have to that you have a, the... The electronic system is 10,000 degrees, it does not change anything in the structure as you need, the phonon system has to be heated. You need a nuclear motion that you can destroy something. With the electronic system, no. So, but the electron system temperature rise actually drives the temperature rise of the uh, lattice and the spin systems because it's- Yeah, yeah. but of course, then it heats up the lattice system and it depends on the specific heat between these two parts. If the lattice heat, system is heated over the melting temperature and of course that happened then you destroy the sample so the limiting factor here is the melting point the melting the point yeah okay. i would say when you have uh yeah theoretically yes for a definition yes we as experimentalists know that we need a uniform magnetized film that means we have to deposit a thin cobalt film on gold or whatever and we know when we heat over 500 degree, gold starts to penetrate into the yeah. into the nickel field. So yeah. that can then be then the limited factor. Like that. Maybe so, we take some more questions. So we can can I just uh, just one uh, last question about the iron nickel alloys that you have shown? So uh, the difference in the demagnetization times can it be related to the Curie temperature of these materials? Yes. When you have separated them, that is this compound formula. Don't ask yes. me. There are so many free parameters inside. Yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, it depends on many on the mag magnetic moment of the atom. What is for me a little bit strange. So it's not simple that you can say the degree temperature just depends on that. But I think you have to ask here pure magnetic people in magnetism how the degree temperature depends on the parameter of the crystal in the or something. Oh, I'll be really careful. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. So maybe uh, the transport part would go with uh, the nickel gold and nickel MGO. Yes. So I think understand what you what are the scattering, why the time scale is different in those two cases. Why the time scale? Yes. Okay. You broke just the nickel film, let's say, the 10 nanometer nickel film. And you broke the difference between majority and minority electrons. And that is two effects. Either they flip the spin, or one of them moves away, you know, wherever they go. And then when they move out, you do not broke them. And you have neutral spin electrons back that also reduces the magnetization. It's the transfer of angular momentum due to the spin transport into the gold or into the copper, whatever you have a substrate. But that seems to be very fast. On this halfway ballistic, on halfway diffuse, on hopefully you call it super diffuse. Okay, maybe the right word or not. That. Okay, so uh, this, I was wondering this, uh, surface roughness that plays a role or something yeah roughness oxygen I mean, the surface is not completely when it's slightly oxidized so you can see that that makes differences you have to do it very good otherwise you will not see this true factor of two 
everything or reflects the electron on the interface produces a transport effect. Okay. Yeah, this uh, you showed at some point that uh, by coating the system, uh, I think the ferromagnet by gold, you can actually kill the oyster effect. Yeah. So what is the reason behind it? <laughs> oh, of course. Again, as I explained before, they run away or they destroy somehow this the difference, or maybe one uh, runs the nickel and pass transport and the iron or something like that. I, I'm not sure. We need for the theories behind it. Of course, it must be a transport, a spin selective or element selective transport, which is fast. We have seen that. Which somehow, when the oil effect is still here, but it's immediately reduced due to the transport. It's for me strange, and I'm waiting for the calculation from open here if the theory can give the same results, but it doesn't make sense for me. Mm -hmm. But we nicely can theoretically explain that when you have a thin film, when the transfer is that stopped somehow, because you create the spin polarization with gold film, that effect is not so strong when you have a thick film. As a, but you can calculate that. That fits well with the theory. But why that is so effective, I'm still astonished about it. The other question is that we have uh, already seen that uh, the spin field scattering and the super diffusive spin transport, these two effects can coexist in systems. Yeah. So what about oyster? Can oyster coexist with other other mechanisms? For example, the exchange. I think we have a nickel iron exchange, but we have not brought it systematically. So that will be the next step. But uh, yes, uh, I might have more interest in how Magnum is coming to this game or something like that, maybe. But yes, I'm quite sure that. They are on exchange should be, but the exchange seems not to be so fast because it takes a certain time until nickel and iron are again at the same level. That can only happen due to exchange scattering between them. But also here we have to be careful, it depends critically how large iron or nickel cluster are in the film that may also play a role. How good your thermal oil is. We have to play a little bit with the quality of the film if you can decrease or decrease the effect. But the last question is that I, I couldn't follow properly. Did you say that you always need oyster for transient magnetic generation or enhancement? Yeah, we discussed that today in uh, with your students. I I still would say off can you have spin orbit scattering on the spins, not a good quantum number anymore. Let's say for that. But without spin orbit couple, uh, optical excitation never changed magnetization. Because uh, the angular momentum to the optical pulse is not enough that you can change anything. Um, the, the, you cannot flip the spin to an optical excitation. So you cannot create certainly, uh, we discussed that this morning, when you excite one electron, you do not change magnetization just to spin up electron at that moment it will not change magnetization we have still the same amount of spin up and spin down you have to flip the spin you have to transfer angular momentum away that's not possible optically no but if there is a transport of majority and minority spin in two different regions when you have a transport then yes then when but that's not something we discussed this morning when right. you have a yeah. transport then of course and you just then then for one spin compounding out of the broad system i agree then yes right. but it's a secondary process mm -hmm. it's not so that the primary process with optically even not with circular polarized light you can create a spin for a okay thank you or why somebody has to <laughs> show me different I, You can create spin polarized electrons, of course. The gallium arsenide is a source of spin polarized electron, but that does not mean the gallium arsenide from magnetic.
So yes. it's, yeah, so it's. So uh, I have the question that after the oyster effect, which is occurring. So uh, after the oyster effect, which is occurring within few femtoseconds, then for rest of the dynamics, which mechanism is dominating? Like, is there a further spin flip or a spin transport mechanism occurring for the demagnetization and remagnetization dynamics? As when you have an exchange couple system, I thought that directly then the exchange interaction will do the next job before transport on the the outfit starts in. Now this very recent, they are not published these results. They show that transport can be faster than exchange, but maybe that depends a little bit on the system, on the, what kind of electron you excite, how heavy they are. So it's just the first measurements. We, we have to repeat it with different systems. Okay. In after oyster, so the other uh, one of the other two are either the two mechanisms. Because yeah, we have to be careful. Of course, every process starts immediately, but some are slower and some are faster. And it goes along this. It's like a, a current or so. You have different scattering processes, and some are more efficient than others. But all, of course, happen. And uh, another question uh, is that when the two effects are occurring at the same time, the like spin flip scattering and the spin diffusive transport, is there any way to uh, separate out the contribution from these two uh, effects? Like you can avoid transport using uh, a thin film on a, on a isolated dielectric material, then you have no transport. But the opposite that you have only transport and no spin flip now. As a, I I have no idea how to it would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I suppose there's no good questions. So once more we thank the speaker for the presentation. Thanks for everyone for the interesting questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So we have the outside. Thank you very much. All the way.